All right. Welcome, everybody, to a Chemistry 150 video. I'm Brad Neal here with the University of Indianapolis. Um, we're going to do some practice problems that um, might represent some kinds of problems you'll see on the exam. The exam is on Thursday, uh, the week of the 30th. Um, so that would be uh, starting on April 2nd. The exam starts on Thursday, April 2nd, and it's going to end on Saturday. Um, please make sure you check your emails uh, and reach out to me if you have any questions. We've talked about that a bunch um, in previous videos. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get this party started. Okay, um, so first up, April Fool's. We still do have a test. It's not funny, I know, but I wanted to do something for me. Okay, so let's start walking through these problems. So the last time we did a discussion section, we did kind of uh, representative problems over the first half of the thermochemistry chapter. We're going to finish now with problems from the second half of the thermochemistry chapter. So here we go. Um, first off, we've got um, a reaction that is SO3, so uh, sulfur trioxide, monosulfur trioxide, mixing with water to form uh, sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And we know it's a sulfuric acid because it's got that aqueous written out there. Okay, so this is the last step in uh, the commercial production of um, sulfuric acid. The enthalpy change for this reaction is negative 227 kilojoules. Okay, so enthalpy change, the, ch the enthalpy change. So we should be thinking in our heads, um, delta H is a negative... 227 and specifically it tells us for this reaction so this is the enthalpy of reaction um, in designing a sulfuric acid plant is it necessary to provide heating or cooling of this reaction and explain why okay so what this is trying to get at is really uh, a better understanding of do you understand um, the logistics and what the when we're saying these thermodynamic terms what's actually happening in the real world so first off let's start parsing out the situation well we've got a situation here where we've got sulfuric acid um, being formed and we're generating heat and a lot of it. This negative here is telling us we've got an exothermic process. So we've got an exothermic process. Another way of thinking about this is since it's exothermic, heat is a product or reactant. That's right. Heat is going to be a product. I know that's what you said. Okay, so if heat is going to be a product, this is going to be a reaction that if we were to touch the container that the reaction's happening in, it's going to feel pretty warm. So if we're building a sulfuric acid plant, should we heat the container that the hot hot reaction is in or should we cool the container that the reaction that produces a lot of heat is in? Well, it should probably be cooled. The idea here by cooling it is if we're cooling a process that's producing a ton of heat, we have way less danger of possibly boiling our water because remember up there in our equation, it told us that we've got water here. And if we're generating too much heat, we might actually turn that water into steam. And steam 
gets pretty nasty in a lot of chemical processes uh, just because now we've gone from a liquid to a gas the volume is very different um, because that volume change now gets so much bigger it could really cause some harm so it makes a lot more sense for us to cool this process off because it's generating a ton of heat um, this allows us to have more safety and the whole sh uh, nine yards the whole shebang so punchline what we're given is that this is an exothermic process we know it's an exothermic process because delta h right here is a nice negative number so we've got an exothermic process and if we think through it a little bit heating something that's generating a ton of heat only makes it more dangerous whereas if we try to cool off the thing that's generating a ton of heat that usually makes it safer so that would be uh, our explanation of why cooling makes much more sense okay uh, next item up for bids we've got a sample of nickel and um, it is heated to 99.8 degrees Celsius and it's going to be placed in a coffee cup calorimeter containing 150 grams of water at 200 or I'm sorry at 23.5 degrees Celsius after the metal cools okay so it's being placed in the water and the metal is now cooled the final temperature of the metal and the water mixture so final temperature of the metal and the final temperature of the water is 25 degrees Celsius. If the specific heat of nickel is 0 0.44 joules per degree Celsius times gram, what is the mass of the nickel that was originally heated? And we're going to assume no heat lost to the surroundings. Okay, so there's a bunch of things going on here. Let's first identify the things that are given to us. All right, so first off, we've got nickel. We also have water. Okay, what do we know about the nickel? What do we know about the water? Well, we know that the water had 150 grams, 150.0 grams. We know that the temperature initial, oops, let's do that a little better. Temperature initial of the water was 23.23.5 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature of our nickel was 99.8 degrees Celsius. Okay. We know that the final temperature of both of them is going to be 25 degrees Celsius because it's telling us the final temperature of our mixture. If the specific heat, okay, so now we have a specific heat, lowercase c here, if the specific heat of nickel is 0 0.44 joules per degree Celsius times grams. What is the mass of the nickel that was originally heated? Okay, so we're looking for this number right here. This is what we're looking for. Okay. And look at all the information that we've been given for these two different things. If it helps, let's draw a picture here quickly to illustrate what has actually happened um, in this problem. So we had water. We have nickel. And I'm going to just draw it as a cube. And the nickel gets dumped into the water. That's the entire process. Now the nickel was hot, the water was cool, they reached thermal equilibrium, and up above uh, our little image here is the entire stat sheet for 
um, what all is happening here, excuse me, what all is happening as part of this process. Um, so, the information that we're given, we've got written down, the information that we're wanting we've got written down. Now it's up to us to figure out how this information can be related to one another. So let's start using some of our thermodynamic terms. First, let's think about system and let's think about surroundings because we've done that a lot in this class. Specifically because our nickel is going into our water, right? Let's call the nickel our system and let's call the water our surroundings. The nice thing about doing this is, is if we're going to from the problem it says no heat is lost to the surroundings and if we're working with a coffee cup calorimeter okay so we know a coffee cup calorimeter has an open top to it um, so that's telling us that this process is being done under constant pressure And if we're not losing heat to the surroundings, um, the surroundings, what it's referring to specifically here, isn't the water as our surroundings. What it's saying is like the air out here. So he, we're not, when we transfer the nickel into the water, all the energy from the nickel is going into the water. It's not being lost into the air above the water. So those red squiggles, that's where we're not losing energy. So by calling the water our system, our surroundings, we're not saying that the heat is not transferring from the nickel into the water. What we're saying is no energy is being lost from either the nickel or the water into the air above it or into the coffee cup itself. So we've got constant pressure calorimetry taking place or constant pressure energy exchange taking place. That's a better way of saying that. If it's constant pressure, it's kind of nice because we have that concept that we talked about of any kind of energy exchange via the first law of thermodynamics being Q surroundings equal Q system. So if Q surroundings equals Q system, well, we got all kinds of things that we can work with. Now to do the math, I'm going to go over to another page here. Okay, so we have our negative Q surroundings equals Q system. If it makes you feel better, you can say negative Q water equals Q nickel. It's totally fine, totally legal. Cool, so that's the energy change in terms of heat. Well, how do we measure heat when energy change. Well, one of the nice equations that we had was Q equals MC delta T. Sometimes that C is an S. Just depends on the book you're reading. And where the M is going to be the mass of whatever we're looking at, C is going to be the specific heat of the thing we're looking at. And delta T is always going to be defined as temperature final minus temperature initial. Well, this is really great because this now allows us to set up a plug and chug kind of scenario. We can take this and plug it into our relationship that we already have written out. So we can end up with something that's negative, and I'm going to open up a bracket here, mass of our water times the specific heat of our water. Now, one of the things that I would, I've, I've mentioned this in lectures, but I would remind you, um, make sure you use your phase properly because this is where a lot of book uh, students get tripped up and books might try to, air quotes, trick you. Water you're going to see in tables as being a solid liquid and, like, and a gas. Make sure you pick the right specific heat, specifically the specific heat for the specific thing that you're, the specific phase that you're looking for. Can I say specific many more times? In this case, it's liquid water. And so then it's going to be delta T 
of our water. Close our parentheses, and that's going to equal m, now nickel, c of our nickel, and delta t of our nickel. Okay, cool. Why is this cool? Because with the help of a book um, and the information we had on the previous page, we know the mass of our water. It was that 150 grams. We know the initial and the final temperature of our water. So we're good there. We know the specific heat of nickel because it gave it to us in the problem. And we know the initial and the final temperatures of our nickel. We don't have the mass of our nickel. And you might be looking at this and be saying, hey, we don't have our specific heat of our water. Well, we don't have the specific heat of the water given to us in this problem, but um, your homework is going to assume that you have those values already because you have access to your book and your test is an open book test. So that number is going to be available to you as well. You'll just have to look it up in a table. So we have all three of the things here that we need in order to figure out um, the one that we don't, which would be the mass of our nickel. So it's plug and chug time. So we've got ourselves a negative mass of our water of 150 grams times the specific heat of water. And if we look that up in a book, it's 4.18 joules per gram times degrees Celsius, and then times our change in temperature. Okay, so our final temperature of our water is going to be that 25 degrees, and the initial was by nice balmy 23.5 degrees. Equals, we don't have the mass of our nickel. The specific heat of our nickel was given to us as 0 0.44 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. And for our change in temperature, it's going to be the final temperature, 25, because that's the final temperature that the nickel had, minus the 99.8 degrees Celsius. I'm kind of running out of room here. That now that we've plugged in our numbers, because we set our equations up properly, now it becomes a situation where we can plug in the numbers, chug out our answer. So we can make everything here on the left equal a number, everything on the right equal a number, um, and we can figure out what the mass is of our stuff. Now, a couple of things to point out before we get into that math. Uh, specifically right here for this temperature change of nickel totally cool totally valid to have a negative temperature change there if you run into that negative keep it don't pitch it um, it's useful it's totally worthwhile um, and it's necessary but do remember for that delta t it's final minus initial always even if it gives you a negative okay so you do your math and you hit the pause on the video or whatever it is and you should find that you end up with a number that's around 28 grams of nickel. Excuse me. Okay. Let's do another problem. All right, we've got heat capacity of a bomb calorimeter. Um, and this is a kind of problem that, as I uh, have said in lectures, it's going to be useful for you to um, go through and make sure you read those. There's a good chance that you're going to have some kind of bomb calorimeter problem on your exam. So we've got a heat capacity of a bomb calorimeter, and it was determined by burning 6.78 grams of methane. Um, the energy of combustion was equal to 
negative 802 kilojoules per mole of methane, CH4 is methane, in the bomb. Now when we say bomb, this is not like a, it goes kind of bomb. What this is, is it's a uh, sealed container where the volume is held constant. Um, but we burn stuff inside it. So the pressure will change, but the volume stays the same. Um, and we can measure uh, internal energy changes that way. The temperature change changed by 10.8 degrees. Okay, so what's the heat capacity of the bomb? And then it's going to ask us here um, a question that's going to be direct, directly related after we answer what the heat capacity of the bomb is. Okay, so let's talk through a little bomb calorimetry here. So specifically, we're going to run into another one of those nice situations where um, heat lost is going to equal heat gain. So the heat gained by the calorimeter, I'm going to call it the bomb because that's what we normally call it. is going to equal the heat loss by the combustion of the methane. Nice. Cool. So can we figure out how much energy was actually lost by the methane? Yeah, we can. We can say, well, the heat loss of the methane is going to equal the mass of our methane. And we've always said that mass is pretty crummy. We don't really use it in our problems. So let's go ahead and convert that to moles. So uh, the molar mass of methane, if you go to the periodic table, you should be able to get something around 16.04 grams of methane for every one mole of methane. grams cancel. And so now we're in moles of methane. Great. Still doesn't necessarily help us. It does. It helps us out a lot. Because we see it in the question up here, the energy of combustion, the energy of combustion for methane was determined to be the number that's given. So that's telling us that 802 kilojoules of energy are released for every one mole of methane that is combusted. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a conversion factor. It's a ratio, it's an equivalency, it's the things that we've talked about a whole bunch of times. So now it's up to us to use that equivalency properly. So for every one mole of methane that gets combusted, we said that it's gonna be 802 kilojoules of energy released. Cancel out units, moles of methane cancel, and now we're left in energy, specifically the amount of energy that gets released by combusting that much methane. So now if we pause, we're going to find that 340 kilojoules of energy were released by the combustion of 6.79 grams of methane. That's useful. Why is that useful? because it allows us to solve for the heat capacity of the bomb. Specifically here for question A, for the heat capacity, C, big C, heat capacity, capacity of bomb. Because of the way bomb calorimetry experiments are set up, we'll take how much energy was released by the sample that was combusted inside said bomb. And we're gonna divide that by the temperature change that was registered as part of the apparatus. So it's gonna be 10.8 degrees Celsius. So we're going to find then that capital C, the heat, the heat capacity of our bomb, our bomb calorimeter, that 340 kilojoules is going to be equal to 31.5 kilojoules per degree Celsius. Cool. That's telling us 
uh, a lot about our bomb. Um, that's really important. That heat capacity, uh, like we talked about previously, uh, gives us an indication of how much energy it takes to raise the uh, temperature of our bomb calorimeter. So it takes that much energy to raise the temperature of our bomb. Cool. How's it going to help us? It's going to help us out when we do part B now. Because in part B, we're talking about uh, acetylene, which is a different compound, it's C2H2. Um, it's often used in welders, um, so acetylene welders. Um, it's a highly combustible uh, gas. It really does some uh, gnarly stuff. It makes a really nice hot flame. Um, when we burn 12.6 grams of acetylene inside our bomb, now we're going to see the temperature is going to increase by increase 16.9 degrees Celsius. By having the specific, the heat capacity of our bomb and by knowing exactly how much the temperature change was by burning or by combusting acetylene, we can back calculate out what the energy of combustion of acetylene is. So let's do that. Again, we have a situation of heat loss, and this time it's going to be by our acetylene, is going to equal the heat gain by the bomb. So, how much heat was gained by the bomb calorimeter? Well, we know it went up. 16.9 degrees Celsius. We know its heat capacity is from part A 31.5 kilojoules per degree Celsius. Recapping, we've got our temperature change. Multiply that now by our heat capacity. And we're going to end up with a number that's around 532 kilojoules. So this was the amount of energy that was gained by the calorimeter by the combustion of our acetylene. Cool. Energies of combustion are reported in kilojoules per mole. What we have are the amount of kilojoules this 532 kilojoules that we have is really per 12.6 grams of our acetylene because that's how much of our acetylene it took to produce that much heat. So we need to convert that into kilojoules per mole. Well, nicely, we can use our molar mass we can calculate that out. We can get a nice 26.04 grams of acetylene for every one mole of acetylene. Do some canceling of units that are the same. And wouldn't you know, we now have our answer in the units of kilojoules per mole. And if you punch in your numbers here, uh, what you're going to end up with is a 1.10 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole. But we're not done. We are not done. Because this is our energy change of combustion. But but it's the acetylene that's combusting. And since the acetylene is combusting, that's why this relationship that we have up here is so important. The heat lost is going to be equal to the heat gain. So the acetylene is losing heat. That's telling us it's an exothermic process. If it's an exothermic process, what we need to say is that this is going to be a negative numeric value. So our energy of combustion is going to be a negative 1.10 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole. 
because it's heat being released. It's energy being released as part of the combustion. It's not being absorbed as part of the combustion. So that negative sign is going to be absolutely necessary here in order to do this problem. And that's kind of the basics of a, a math problem for bomb calorimetry. It's kind of nice. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that the answer sheet has the answers for this problem. Um, if you can do this problem for Hess's Law, there's nothing I can do to stop you um, in terms of like difficulty because this is a pretty difficult Hess's Law problem. If you can do this one, you're in really, really great shape. Okay. Oops. Last example. Um, so we've got the reusable booster rocket of a space shuttle. Um, it's a mixture of aluminum and ammonium perchlorate as fuel. Um, a possible reaction for this is given above. Calculate delta H naught for this reaction. Hint, use the standard enthalpies of formation. All right. So this is kind of like the uh, problems that we did in the very last lecture for thermochemistry. In order to do the problem above, you have to look up what the enthalpies of formation are for all the different species that are involved. So what we're going to do here um, in this video is we're going to set the problem up conceptually, and then I'm going to highly encourage you um, to look up those values in your book. So here we go. The enthalpy of this particular reaction. All right, we said that the basic equation here is this sum of the number of moles of our products times the enthalpy of formation of our products minus the sum of the number of moles of our reactants times the enthalpy of formation of our reactants. All right. The great news is on this problem, we have lots of reactants and lots of products. That was me being facetious. This is going to be a lot of numbers that we're going to need to keep track of. So we're going to have to use parentheses and brackets and that jazz uh, well in order to keep track of things. So let's get started. Um, I'm also going to decrease the width of the font here so that I can try to get this to fit. So delta H is going to equal, and well, let's get started with our products. Product number one is our aluminum oxide. So specifically, um, we need to make sure that we have a balanced equation. If we take a look at our balanced equation, uh, do we have ourselves something that's balanced? And yes, we do have something that's balanced. Nice. Notice how I went, first thing I did was make sure that that was a balanced equation before I started doing math. All right. I definitely know something that I'm going to be doing in, to your test to make sure that you're paying attention to that. So here we go. We've got um, one mole of our aluminum oxide, and that's going to be multiplied by the enthalpy of formation of our aluminum oxide. Okay, next, and we're going to put that whole thing in parentheses, plus next product. Our next product is one mole of aluminum chloride times the change in enthalpy, or I'm sorry, the change in enthalpy of formation of our aluminum chloride. Close our parentheses, plus next product, uh, three moles of nitrogen monoxide times the enthalpy of formation of our nitrogen monoxide, close parentheses, plus, because we still have one more product, we have six moles of water times the enthalpy of formation oops enthalpy of formation of our water 
And that's our last product. So everything there that is in our brackets here to here, all of this, this is all, tell you what, this is all just relating to this part of this equation up here at the top. All right, time to do the reactants. So minus, open bracket, our reactants are going to be 3 mole of aluminum times the enthalpy of formation of our aluminum. Close our parenthesis. And then minus, or I'm sorry, plus, uh, minus plus our uh, 3 moles of our ammonium perchlorate. NH4, ClO4 times the enthalpy of formation of our ammonium chlorate. All right, and that is the last of our uh, reactants. So now everything that is in the blue Everything that's in the blue is corresponding to the second half of this equation right here. All right, that's how we'd set it up. What you're gonna have to do is for this value, for this value, for this value, for this value, and for this value, go look them up in a book. What you might have noticed is I did not, did not highlight, let's see here, this one right here. I did not say you're gonna have to look that up in a book because you should know that that's aluminum in its standard state. And then enthalpy of formation of an element in its standard state is equal to zero. So you shouldn't have to look that one up. But if you do, it should still probably be in the table in your book. So now this becomes a plug in numbers, chug out answer kind of problem. And yeah, there's a lot of numbers that you're gonna have to plug in. Some of them are gonna be negative and you're gonna have to use your calculator properly, but it is a plug and chug scenario at this point in time. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the second half of the worksheet. Um, please let me know if you have questions, comments, concerns, visions, revelations about any of the stuff that we just did. And uh, yeah, best of luck.